Hi, everybody. Welcome to our nonprofit finance materials. Um, this is going to, this nonprofit finance topic is going to take us through the remainder of the semester. Um, we are going to start off, though, not talking about finance per se, but starting off with some economic analysis and how altruism fits in. This is an important thing to understand because nonprofits rely so heavily and are driven so powerfully by altruism. And so this is a chance for us to dig into the way altruism works in an economic sense. So for this first of the two class sessions, the goals are to know the characteristics of public goods, to know the three different kinds of altruism that we're going to discuss. I want you to know and understand the significance of something called the Nash equilibrium in questions of altruism. So those are the three concepts for this class session. So uh, if you've taken econ before, you're familiar with this idea of a public good, probably. Um, but if not, the idea of a public good is it's, it's some sort of thing of value that people share publicly. And the way we measure how, how, how public a good is is by two uh, criteria. The first one is that public goods are generally what are called non-rival. And what non-rival means is that the consumption by one person of that good doesn't reduce the good for some other person. A good example of this is national defense. Um, I don't consume national defense in a way that makes less of it available to anybody else. It's not like uh, me, um, you know, using up the, uh, you know, taking the last uh, the, the, the last M and M's from the vending machine or something like that. the The point is, is that I'm I, I can't use it up in a way that makes less of it. It makes meaningfully less for anybody else. Sometimes goods are non-rival because there's no way to consume them. Um, a good example of this is God's love. God's love is a public good and that it's available to everybody. It's non-rival, meaning that it's it, it, I can't use up any significant amount of it in a way that makes it so nobody else has access to it because it's an infinite resource. But another example is one is a resource that's just so plentiful and so abundant that it's non-rival in practice. An example of that would be oxygen. I breathe in and use oxygen on a daily basis, and I am diminishing the amount of oxygen available to other breathers, but I'm not doing it in a way that's creating a meaningful reduction, reduction meaning that, that there's nobody else who can't breathe oxygen because I've used it up. So that's what it means for something to be non-rival. Non-excludable means that artificial means can't be used to keep someone from consuming the good. A good example of this is a public fireworks display. So, you know, I live in Provo and the the big Freedom Festival happens every summer. And the fireworks that go, up, that go up in the air, you can't stop people from seeing them. Now, perhaps the people running the Freedom Festival would prefer being able to prevent people from seeing those in-air fireworks because then they could charge for admission to, to, to see them. But but they can't, and so it becomes a public good because there's no way to exclude other people from accessing it. Other examples of public goods are like public parks, um, uh, freeways, uh, and other resources that are just open to the general public. Now, nonprofits are interesting because a lot of nonprofits don't actually produce public goods directly, but they produce them indirectly. And a good example of this, I mean, here I've got a picture of an old-fashioned soup kitchen. The modern version of that, obviously, today is a, is a community food bank. But the point is, a food bank is not a public good. A food bank, for example, could prevent you from coming and getting food there because you might be too high income. So that means it's, it's not non-excludable. And then the other problem is it's, it's it certainly isn't non-rival because the amount of food taken out of a food bank diminishes meaningfully the amount of food available to others who might go there. So the question is, is, is this just an aberrant nonprofit? Is it failing to produce public goods? And the answer is no, it absolutely is producing public goods, even though it's using private goods to accomplish that. By handing out food to those who need it in a community, What's happening is they're reducing crime rates, they're increasing basic health, they're making a community safer and healthier, and these create public goods that everybody enjoys. If we live in a healthier and safer community because of a local food bank, then that creates benefits that everybody can enjoy, enjoy in a non-rival and non-excludable way. And so that's how nonprofits generally produce public goods is either directly, like with the Freedom Festival, producing a fireworks display, or indirectly by creating outcomes 
or 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 positive externalities that make us all better off. So so that's the concept of public goods, and it will be important throughout the remainder of the semester. So let's talk about altruism. Altruism is an interesting phenomenon economically, um, and it's actually one that economists have struggled with at various times. Um, if we put altruism in the context of public goods, this is where altruism comes in. One of the ways we get public goods is through taxes, and we do that by requiring everybody to pay, but then we give everybody access. So, so the funding is compulsory, but then the access is open to everyone. Another way we get public goods, or quasi-public goods, is through what's called pooling. And this is where people participate voluntarily, but only those who participate get access to the shared good. And so this is like an HOA um, having maybe a shared clubhouse. Now, that may not seem like a true public good, but within the confines of those who are part of the pool, it is a public good. And so that's another way you get public goods. But then the last way is through altruism. What's different about altruism is you don't require people to f fund it, but then you make it open to everybody. And that's different that taxes are compulsory, but then you open it to everyone. Pooling is voluntary, but then only open to those who funded it. Altruism is voluntary, voluntary and open to everybody. But the question is, how do you, what motivates people to, 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 to make these contributions? Why, why are some people willing to put money into something that a bunch of other people get to enjoy without having paid into? Altruism is actually an evolutionary concept. Um, it's used by evolutionary biologists to identify survival traits. This is where one member of a species will sacrifice its own welfare to, benefit, to promote the survival of the species, a mother bear protecting her cubs, for example. And so it's generally seen as a survival trait, but the sad truth is that um, human beings don't always value promotion of the species. And so economists struggle with how to model altruism because how do you describe a behavior that um, is not driven for self-interest but is driven by, other, by the interests of others? And so what happens is economists have this problem because self-interest is a fundamental assumption of economics. And if you're going to account for altruism, you have to sort of manipulate or change the way people think of self-interest, or you just call altruism non-rational behavior altogether. And neither of those are ideal. And this has been a struggle within economics for for centuries, actually. So here's a quote from an, from a, <clears throat> from an economist from years ago, or a couple hundred years ago who pointed out that you know, no matter how selfish we think people may be, there's something about us that makes the, the happiness of others important to us. Even if we only see other people being happy, it's important to us. And yet, if we go around expecting people to just be benevolent and, and be generous, we're not going to get very far in life. We have to figure out a way to get their self-interest to benefit us, to work in our favor. Um, and we do that in the economy all the time. You do that with your employer, right? The, the idea is, is you're, you need money from your employer, and your employer needs work from you. And that's those, those, those are two self-interested motivations, but you figure out a way to trade based on those self-interested motivations. We're going to talk about other examples of this. But the most important point that I want to make is that both of these came from Adam Smith, who is generally seen as the poster boy of the quote on the right-hand side and this idea that everybody is fundamentally self-interested, but not so much of the quote on the left-hand side, even though he actually was, um, he wrote a great book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments that talked about this instinctively altruistic nature that's built into humanity. Subsequent economists have tried to make more sense of this. One of them, who's I think one of the best economists in this space, is a guy named James Andrioni. And economists try to figure out what is what what motivates us, what what uh, what incentives we have in making our decisions. And Andrioni tried to model three different kinds of motives that relate to altruism. One of them he called pure altruism, and this is where you give without any personal benefit. Um, this is. Um, something we're going to talk about in class, and I'm going to challenge you to try to come up with examples of, of, of actions that are actually purely altruistic. <clears throat> um, by the way, this, this isn't meant to be morally infused language. Andrioni's not trying to say that one is morally better than the other. He's just describing the motives in a more matter-of-fact way. And so pure altruism is the idea that you, you work to benefit somebody else or you sacrifice to benefit somebody else without, without any intention of personal gain. He also describes something called impure altruism, which is the idea that you give to somebody else, but 
doing it be, because you know it'll make you feel good and that cr- generates what he called a warm glow benefit and i'm going to come back to that term warm glow quite a bit through the remainder of the semester and then the third kind of altruism he described as enlightened self-interest and this is where you give because you expect it to make you better off at some remote point in the future. So the idea is that I might give to a food bank because I want to reduce crime in my community because it makes it less likely that my house will be broken into. That's an example of enlightened self-interest. A religious example of this is paying your tithing so you can go to heaven. Um, You know, that's not an immediate transaction. You don't pay your tithing bill and then automatically go to heaven, but you give with the expectation that that will be your ultimate reward. That's another example of enlightened self-interest. There is a more elegant way to resolve all this that I'm going to talk about, and I call this concept whole interest. And really, I think something that makes a lot more sense is if we change not so much the interest part, but we change the way we think of self. Um, Usually when an economist is talking about the self of self-interest, it's being conceived by most people like this, where it's you're just thinking about your immediate person. But the reality is our definition of self is not this narrow. Most of us have a definition of self that incorporates other people. I'm a father because I have children. I'm a husband because I have a wife. These are parts of my identity, but they require other people. And being a father and a husband, being a neighbor, being a friend, being a teacher, all of these things mean that my self-identity is going to be motivated differently because I've incorporated uh, incorporated other people into my definition of self. We're going to have a deeper discussion about this in class, but the reality is that the really great um, people of history, the ones we admire the most, are the ones who figured out to expand their relationships with others, even with total strangers or people they would never meet in their entire life, but they expand their definition of self to incorporate others, and that's what motivates their decision-making so that there's not really a difference in their mind between just doing something for themselves and doing something for someone else. And this actually probably is a more accurate description of the way people, of what motivates most of the day-to-day altruism that people engage in. One of the problems of altruism is that if you have voluntary contributions, but you make the research, the public good available to everybody, is it creates the opportunity for what economists call free riders. And free riders are people who enjoy a public good without making a contribution to it. Um, One thing that gives great insight into free riding is something called the Nash equilibrium. And this is um, from John Nash, who was uh, portrayed in the film A Beautiful Mind. He was a game theorist who won the Nobel Prize in economics for this insight. But he basically said that, you know, if I can... If I can't be better off by changing my strategy, then I'm going to stay where I am, is the basic insight. And you eventually reach a point where if everybody is doing that, where everybody says, I can't be better by changing, so I'm going to stay where I am. Well, if everybody stays in their current strategy, whatever it is, then you reach the Nash equilibrium and nothing will change. And Andrioni, James Andrioni did some interesting research and pointed out that the Nash Equilibrium explains why some public goods get funded and others don't. And we're going to talk about this example in class of a capital campaign that starts with a seed donation versus not, and how this actually creates a, a difference in the likelihood of success based on the Nash Equilibrium. But that's something we'll talk more about in class. <clears throat> so the problem with free riders is that all public goods create a potential for people to be free riders. And so free riders benefit from the public good without contributing to it. One of the ways we try to compensate for that is with social norms. So we look down on free riders and and we find ways to shame them, um, even if we can't necessarily compel them. And so this is one of the ways we try to accomplish this. So, and the way we try to manage free riders. And so talking now, finally, about tying nonprofits and altruism together, I just have a few insights to share. I mean, society obviously likes the public goods that are provided by nonprofits. Another important point, though, is that very few people are pure altruists. Most are impure altruists. At that point, we're going to discuss more deeply in class. And then another problem for, for, for nonprofits to stay funded is that almost everybody free rides at some point. I mean, if you've ever listened to NPR without contributing or watched PBS without contributing, you became a free rider. And so we need to sort of make sense of this and try to figure out, okay, how do nonprofits keep operating just based off of altruism if there's all this opportunity for free riding and there's this natural instinct for self-interest? So we're going to talk about this more deeply. I do want to end with just three other things that are alternative perspectives about what motivates people to be altruistic. 
Um, there are some economists who argue that it's a primarily evolutionary instinct in us of sympathy that we just, our brains are wired to think of others that are similar to us like ourselves. And so we'll act accordingly. Amartya Sen, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist who did, was a welfare economist. He said that actually altruism is usually driven by commitment, meaning it's the social ties that bind us together. And so we make these commitments to each other and to society at large, and that's what drives our altruistic behavior. But there's another economist who had a more cynical view of this named Sugden, who said a lot of altruism is actually driven by an urge to keep up, meaning that there's a lot of social signaling that goes on. And the idea is essentially that being a member of society means you are expected to give a certain amount. And if you're not going to give, then you don't fit. And so it, so a lot of, so his argument is that a lot of altruism is based on this signaling mechanism where we're essentially showing others who we are by our giving. So anyway, that's, that, that sets us up for session two. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun with that. We'll play a game in class, but, uh, I look forward to seeing you all.